Welcome back to the Mastering Video Marketing Podcast. I'm Tony Reale. And I am Ben Carlson. And today we are going to be talking about uh, the process that we take our new customers through when we're first interacting with them. Um, you know, as we've uh, transitioned our video production company into more of a video marketing agency, uh, we realize that one of the most important steps that we can really take a customer through, uh, a client through, is truly understanding who their customers are yeah. and the process that, that those customers go through when interacting with the company, when deciding if they're going to purchase a product, even what are their, their needs, their wants, their pain points. Yeah. Um, and really mapping that out. Uh, and so we have a process that we go through. We call it the target audience discovery process. And, right. it, and it really boils into two key factors. Um, there's lots of steps to it, but <laughs> the, the two key elements that, that we hand to our client when it's all said and done is uh, the customer avatar. Mm -hmm. And there sometimes there are multiple of those. Sure. And then the customer journey. And we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about what it takes to make that one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about why it's so important and why it's kind of the foundation to good video content. Yeah. And, you know, we, we often, in fact, just this morning, uh, we had a potential client calling up and saying, hey, I want to make a video. Great. Let's, let's make a video. And before we ever get into that, you know, they, a lot of times clients will come in and say, I, I have this idea for a video or I have this need for a video. So uh, they wanted to do a recruiting video for their local fire department. Um, awesome. Yeah, absolutely. We can help out with that. But the question is, you know, if we just go out and start shooting and say, all right, let's come up with this concept and we'll come out and it'll take us two days to shoot and we'll be able to get X, Y, Z uh, footage and we'll put it all together and you'll have a great video to put on your website, put up on LinkedIn, wherever you have it. Um, but stopping to ask and say, all right, who is this actually for? You know, are we trying to bring new people in? Are you trying to hire people from outside? And it's like, no, we, you know, we're a really small community. We just, we want people to feel a sense of pride and join part of the volunteer fire department. We don't really have anything to pay them. Well, that's a very different conversation than, hey, come move to our beautiful city and be part of our team. Um, this is, hey, you're already part of this. You already live here. Um, and so having those discussions right up front whether it's with uh, your, like if you have a client that is looking for work or if you're trying to create a video or content, having that audience in mind is gonna help shape what your content looks like and what that video looks like. And all too often it's the other way around where it's the idea goes first and then whoever it reaches, ah, we, it was either a hit or a miss. It's very, very common for most companies to be too close to their own yeah. brand. Um, yeah, you know, we call it the curse of knowledge where you, you know, so much about your products, you, you know, what makes you different than your competition, you know, what you value, what, what you prioritize, uh, you know, what, uh, you're proud of that you've right. worked really hard to, maybe it's, you've been around a really long time or you have specialty equipment to execute your job or, um, you, you approach it in, in a way that most other companies don't, don't do it. Sure. But does that actually matter to your customers? Yeah. Um, and so if you create, you know, marketing content that is completely wrapped in that perspective of the things that, that we care about as a company and yeah. not what our customers care about, it's just not going to be effective content. Sure. Um, and so that's why we take our customers through this, this target audience discovery process, because when we really map out, it, it's not us telling the customer or the client, uh, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. It's we can guide them to that discovery on their own. Right. Because we say, this is what your customer cares about. This is what they're looking for. This is what they're prioritizing. And that marketing message doesn't, doesn't uh, cater to that. It doesn't yeah. focus on that. So yeah. they're like, Oh yeah, maybe we shouldn't do that. Great. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Exactly. You know, it's, it's leading exactly. the horse to water. And then, you know, it's, it's really getting them to understand that this is the, the best way to approach it. Yeah. Because if you go in and just be like, hey, you know, I think everything you're doing is wrong. You yeah. Know, who's not, most people aren't very receptive to that. Unless they think you're amazing and they hired you specifically because they know that they're doing something wrong. Yeah. You know, you, how many times have you watched like, it was like Hell's Kitchen? What are those shows where, uh, what's <laughs> yeah. but, um, uh, Chef Ramsey, Ramsey yeah, yeah. comes Ooh, in. Chef Ramsey, yeah. 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 And he says, like, completely tearing apart yeah. <laughs> everything. Yeah. And then you have, you have those people that are very receptive to it. Mm hmm. Yes, like, we yes, know that, we need to change. Yeah. And then you have the people that are like, we've been doing it this way for so You don't know what you're talking about. Right, and right. It's like, yeah, what what interaction do you want with your clients? Yeah. 
and we want them to be like, oh yeah, you're right. So yeah. this is a great way of of warming them up to that realization. Sure. And and you know, to your point, you know, that curse of knowledge, we we have a lot of clients who they come to us and say, This is you know, this is the really important message that we need to get out there. We want we need to be telling this. Um, and so they may have a very specific message in mind, but they don't have a specific audience. And or they may have a specific audience, but that specific audience doesn't care about their specific message. So by doing this practice of finding out the the ideal customer avatar and then mapping out what that customer journey looks like, you end up making sure that the messaging meets the audience and that where they are on that journey because the messaging may not meet them where they are on their road, on that roadmap to to finding you. Uh, if it's someone that's never heard about you. They don't. They aren't going to care about how great you are, or that you've been in business for this long. They just need to know what you do, and then you can walk them down. So, um, we, we had we had a client that uh, was looking to do. It was another recruiting video, and they were like, you know, we we need to we want to bring people. This one they did want to bring people in. They were they said we want to bring people into our community. Uh, it was for our local police department, and they said. Our policing is very different here. We we do not want a video of people kicking in doors and you know high action because that's not who the police officers that we're trying to bring in. We want to showcase the community and the community involvement because that's who we want. We want people that care about this community. We want, we want people that can be part of this community. And so by changing that narrative, by changing that messaging in the in the ad, we're able to target an entirely different audience and get them an entirely different pool of candidates. Now, will you probably end up getting some people that, ah, it's a police department. I'm going to go, you know, kick down doors and write a bunch of tickets. Sure. Maybe. Um, but by be being specific, you're going to have more success in reaching exactly who you want to be interacting with your brand. Uh, whether it's a police department, a clothing store, a restaurant, whatever it may be, put out the messaging for the audience that you want to put out there. And so that's why we start with that target audience. Um, right. And, and again, we, it's customer avatar, or customer journey. And when we first started doing this a while back, we had, we, we had the model of the customer avatar and we, that helped us a ton. But when we incorporated the customer journey into it, mm, it completely yeah. opened up, not just uh, an understanding of uh, you know, really all the steps that a customer goes through when interacting with your company, but also realizing that like, it isn't just creating a marketing message that reaches this person. It's also re reaching this person at every step that they right. go through. And there's a different step when somebody's at the beginning of their journey to when they're in the middle and then when they're exactly. in the end. Exactly. So let's go ahead and start with the, the yeah. customer avatar. And so, Ben, we both kind of do this with our customers, but yep. you, you've you been more hands-on with this. So sure. I'm going to let you take point and, and take our audience through this. Yeah. So it is it is a really fun process if if you're doing it right. Um, whether it's if, you know, if you're a, a company and you're looking to do this yourself or if you're trying to do this with your clients, um, have fun with it. I would say that would be the biggest thing. It is, it is weird as a grown up in a professional setting to say, all right, we're gonna put on our five year old caps and we're gonna make, play make believe. But that's really what we're gonna do because we want to get so specific about who this person is. So, um, you know, a lot of times we'll start these these this practice and people will kind of be, oh, I don't know, someone between the age of forty and fifty. Um, but that sometimes it's like we we the the biggest problem is when people are like we we cater to everybody like yeah, everybody likes right. their product you know twenty to fifty male female right like, okay no 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 yeah no we need to really narrow this down we're we're turning this into a person sure not a range of person exactly and and so getting that idea of like no 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 this isn't your this isn't a customer this is Amanda we need to find out who Amanda is and you can have fun with that make up whatever name and sometimes I ask them sometimes we brainstorm a name um, so we had one client it was Amanda who was forty five uh, she was a mid level manager at. Um, a medical uh, facility or insurance company, and we get really specific. How many kids does she have? How What does she do for fun? What brands does she like? So we really find out about who she is. How much does she make in a year? That's, that's a very valuable question to know because that's going to help determine who you're marketing to and how much you can actually spend. And, and that leads into finding the lifetime value of the, the client, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, but we find out about her personality. Is she... Is he or she more analytical? Are they more laid back? What really get diving into the specifics? And again, this is something that I often have to coach clients on is 
Like, yes, this feels weird. I, I know this person doesn't exist. Or sometimes they'll latch on to an actual person and they just start describing. It's like, no, no, no. I don't need to know about real Amanda. Like, let's take your your ideal client, the ideal client that you would want to see in here and find out what that looks like. And then we put it down. Um, so we go through what are her, what are their favorite brands? You know, are they really into designer? You know, are they Louis Vuitton and Prada or are they um, Bass Pro Shop and um, Nike? Because again, we're, we're going to format our messaging to match with this. And that also helps with, you know, kind of where we, where we put these, you know, whether it's, are they, are they f consuming content on TikTok, on Facebook, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, having these ideas of brands and seeing where others are advertising to these um, target audiences is going to help dictate where you go. And then the two top, I think these are the two biggest ones that really, this is where we sink a lot of time are, what are the goals of your client? Um, and when they're coming in and they're interacting with your company, what are their goals? And that that does change depending on where they are in the customer journey. But we start with the assumption that they've found you, they like you, why are they here ready to purchase for you from you? Um, and that that can be a wealth of of reasons. Um, but again, trying to be very specific to your client's goals will help how to best determine your messaging and what you can offer them. Because again, we don't want to have a disconnect. You may offer the greatest tool in the world, but if that's not where your your client is interested in or your target audience is actually interested in, you're going to lose them. You can get them there. You can lead them along that process. But if you find out where their goals are and what they're trying to achieve and you match meet them there, then you can guide them along in that process rather than just trying to hook them in and reel them. Yeah, well, one thing um, I, I just had a short that I released the other day just talking about how a lot of businesses make the mistake of well, what, the hook that I had in the short was just simply stop trying to sell your product or service that you sell. Stop, yeah. stop trying to, yep. to sell that. That's not what people are buying. People are not buying your product or service. They're buying solutions to problems. They're buying solutions to goals. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that they care about. You know, they, they don't really care about the specifications of mm, a thing. Yeah. yeah. Now I get that there are the gearheads that care about that, sure. the, the bells and whistles and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know, I didn't buy a computer for the silicon and the graphics <laughs> yeah. chips and all that kind of stuff, just to sit on a shelf and never be used. I bought it for productivity or for entertainment yeah. or for all those other factors. Yeah. And if it didn't provide that for me, I don't care how cool all the wires and sure. the LED lights look, it's sure. not going to actually do the job for me. It's not beneficial to me. Yeah. So that's the thing that we want to be focusing on in our marketing. So clearly laying out what are the goals, what are the pain points that this customer mm. has yep. will then also be like, make, are we, are we, are we focusing on that? Yeah. Is that part of the message or are we just completely glossing over? The other side of that too, again, in your marketing message is, is kind of closing that gap. If all we're talking about is features, um, yeah. you know, so again, our, our, our processor is 4.8 gigahertz or, or what, what, yeah, all, if you're just talking about numbers, then you're relying on the audience, the customer to close that gap of what does that translate to? Right. Me? Right. So if we say like, well, okay, this times this computer is ten times faster than the last computer, or it's yeah. you know, that starts to translate into information that's understandable. So the more you can close the gap between the the information and the applicability mm. and the benefit mm -hmm. to me, um, the the better and easier it's going to be for your customers to understand that. So again, goal focused is so important. Yeah, and and I think this is a great exercise either for yourself as a company or for your clients, um, that if you're helping to develop this, is this challenges them to come up and really identify some maybe ways that they weren't thinking about. So let's say you're an ice cream shop and you're, you know that you can sell on your quality, you can sell on your, you have great ingredients, uh, but if, if the goal of your audience is not so much, they don't, I mean, yes, it's nice that you have great ing ingredients, but what if they need somewhere to hang out? Where if they want somewhere that they can go and just enjoy a sunny afternoon and have time with their, their friends or their family, they can bring their kids. Um, and that's their goal. So if, if we're marketing and we're saying, oh, we have the freshest ingredients, we have, okay, that's nice. Yeah, if, you, if you spent your entire build out on the kitchen and there's nowhere for anybody to sit. Yeah. What, what good is it doing? Yeah. And so, um, you know, for some, for some companies, it's like, well, man, I guess, you know, the, the goal seems very straightforward. They want ice cream. So we're going to market our ice cream. Is it or is it the experience that they want? Is it that they want your clothing brand or do they want your clothes or do you want do they want your brand? 
Um, and, and so I think there's, it's a great exercise in really trying to hone in on the deeper, um, not just the, what am I trying to, not the, not psychology, the, uh, psychographic, psychographic information. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we look at the infographic information. We look at who they are, the, the, the base details, but then we really find out why they are the way they are with their psychographic. And I think that's where things get really interesting and very, very valuable. Yeah. The three things that you want to focus on, and, and this is part of the, the avatar too, is you, you want to focus on geographic, demographic, and, and psychographic. psychographic. Exactly. Yeah. So geographic, obviously, where are they? If you're, if you're a local business, okay, well, they're probably going to be local. Yeah. But if you're you know, an e-commerce or online business, you might have people from around the country or around the world that are buying from you. Yeah. What are you, some of your dominant ones? Right. Um, psychographic or well, let's so so demographic obviously would be gender, uh, age, um, uh, you know the basic th those types of things. And the psychographic yeah. is going to be mostly interests and ha habits and 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 that type of stuff. So yeah. if you map out each one of those, then then the person becomes holistic and, sure. and more realized. Yeah, yeah. Which which leads to what, in my opinion, the most important aspect of of the customer avatar. And that's their frustration. So we've already looked at their goals. Um, now let's look at what are their frustrations, uh, because this is this is the pain that you can offer a solution to. And we often say that a, com a customer will only buy when the the pain outweighs the cost of the money in their pocket. Did I say that right? Is that about right? So yeah, I you, basically you the right way <laughs> the way that I say it is. Um, yeah, the, the only time a sale goes through is when the money in your pocket is worth less than the problem that That's your the one. product solves. That's exactly it. So by, you know, and again, this is a great, this is a great way to really look at the frustration. So uh, we had a client and we have a client that um, we were, we were doing this with. And one of the frustrations we were talking about, uh, it was a, it was a wellness club. And so uh, one of the frustrations was, you know, the, the outward appearance, you know, the, this, their, their target audience, um, is maybe aging to, and isn't a, you know, doesn't like the way that their body looks. So they're trying to improve it. Great. That is, that is a perfectly viable, and, um, frustration. But as we were really putting ourselves in the mind of this, uh, this target audience, this, you know, Amanda, we said, Amanda's tired of making choices. She makes choices all the day. She makes choices for her kids, what to make for dinner. Once we did once, and I, I want to say it was the owner that that she just kind of very quietly just said, "Oh, she's tired of making choices." That was groundbreaking. That little nugget, because that formed. All right, so if 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 Amanda is tired of making choices, how does that look? How does that equate to our website? Well, because yeah, that was the thing. We took them back to their website, and we we're like, okay. Now think about it from that perspective. They have so many services that they offer there, which is great. And it's it's an amazing location. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, they've got like workout routines and spa treatments and, and so many different things you can do, yeah. nail salon, everything. And you go to the website and it's just almost immediately like a menu of all these different yeah. places you can go. And if Amanda is, is tired of making choices and all she's presented on the website is choices, yeah, that can be a burnout. Check you know, out. Cause we even talked to him and we said like, you know, when people reach out to you, do they have a lot of questions or do they feel fairly qualified? And they're like, oh yeah, most people feel qualified by the time we get, they get to us. And I said, that's both good and bad. Yeah. The good in that is, uh, you know, what the people that are interested are, you have enough content for them uh, either on the website or through other marketing channels to understand who you are and for it to be clear. The problem is anybody that isn't clear isn't making it past that point. Right. You, you have, you have a fall off at that point. And you don't know what that fall off right. is. Yeah. So, um, the, having those frustrations really help shape everything because now your messaging can focus on how easy it is, how knowledgeable your staff is, how easy it is. We can show people interacting and saying, here's what to expect here. You, we're going to, when you call, we're going to know exactly how to book, where to book. You're going to have all the information. You're not going to have to think about a thing that's unwind. If we went through and, and there's a very great way to market a spa where it's, you know, you, we have this service and you're going to be relaxed and you're going to, and you're going to get to choose all these treatments and there's so many choices and you get to, oh, there's so many different options that we have also a viable thing. And that, and that is a great way to stand out. And that's a way that a lot of people go. But when we're looking at our target audience and we say, Amanda does not want those choices. She, she could not be bothered to make one more choice at the end of the day, especially when it's how do I relax? If it's, I have to think a lot or I'm just going to sit on the couch while the kids are asleep 
and just have five minutes, that's what she's going to go with. But if we say, Amanda, I got you. Don't even worry about it. And that's how we frame our messaging of this welcoming, inviting, um, enveloping support system and care where she's going to be taken care of and not have to lift a finger. Well, now Amanda's in. And we would never know if we hadn't gone through that whole exercise and, and really dive into who Amanda is um, or whoever your Amanda is. So I challenge you, get th- really push yourself, push your, push your clients to think about this in ways that you might not have otherwise kind of expected. So when we, that was the first design of our, our customer avatar. And we, we use that for a bit. And then we realized there's still one more metric that we need to incorporate into, into this. And that metric was, um, the target cost of acquisition for a mm-hmm. customer. And the reason that this is so important is because this really dictates what we can justify as a marketing budget as a overall. So the way that we calculate that, here's a little formula for you. So the first thing that we do is we look at the lifetime value of a customer. Right. The lifetime value of a customer uh, is going to be, for every business it's a little different. It yep. could be, it could be, six months, a year, three years, 10 years, like, you know, every business is a little different, but the idea not to say, all right, this customer came in and they, they bought our product the one time and then we'll never see them again. Yeah. It, I mean, that can be the case. If you are a company that sells a single widget and they would never need another widget, then that might be sure. the lifetime yep. value. But if you uh, sell consumables or yeah. you can sell um, a service or whatever it might be, like you might have a larger lifetime value. So you have to figure that in, whatever that might be. So like say for our VR arcade, right. we'll look at it and say, you know, the average uh, spend is anywhere from 50 to to $100 for uh, a birthday party or something like that. Yeah. Um, and if they they have a single life event, um, then across, like, say, three years, maybe their their lifetime value might be 300 bucks. Yeah. Let's just... And that's, that and that's, and that was the way that we did it. We said, yes, they could come back indefinitely. They could right. come back as long as they're open, but we're going to cap it at three months to look at what is the, or three years, sorry, sure. three years to say, what is the, what is in that time frame? So we have a cap. What can we expect? Right. And, and there's another reason we kind of limit it to that and I'll get to it in a second. But so now that we have the lifetime value, if we look at what is the cost, now the next metric is what is the cost uh, of that lifetime yeah. value? So that's uh, your cost of goods sold, your licensing for us at VRK, we have licensing of our, of our video games, the right. hardware, uh, you know, wear and tear and, and replacement of hardware, yeah. staffing, rental, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So whatever the cost of that is, yeah. is what we want to factor in. So if we say that the lifetime value of the customer is $300 and based upon our uh, calculations that the cost to deliver that product service to the customer is say, let's say $150. Yeah. So now we have a margin of $150. Right. Now, for some businesses, that margin is going to be more, and some businesses is going to be less. Right. But the reason that we have that margin is the rule of thumb is that you want the target cost of acquisition of a customer to be less than a third of that margin. Right. So in this case, again, if it's a $150 margin, we want that to be about 50 bucks. Right. So what does that mean? Now, when you could just say, well, if we did a Facebook ad... And we got, you know, uh, uh, the click conversion of a thing. It costs us less than 50 bucks. Yay. Yes, that that is one way to look at it. But we like to look at it more from uh, MER or or marketing efficiency ratio. Right. Uh, So that's where you kind of holistically look at all of your marketing. So we're here doing a podcast right now. This is taking time. It's, you know, there's a cost to host it. There's a cost to edit it. That is, uh, this is one of our, our marketing tools. We're giving to you guys, and hopefully this is a content that you value, but at the end of the day, we're also sharing our expertise so that potential clients, uh, they come across it and then be able to say, hey, you know, I, like, I like these guys, I like their personalities, I got to know them, and maybe this is a company I'd be interested in hiring. Right. So that's a marketing tool. Your ads are marketing tools. Your your website's a marketing tool. Every, everything is a marketing tool. Now, I'm not t- going to talk about, like, staffing or, you know, that's not part of the marketing efficiency ratio. But when you look at MER and then you say, okay, we got this many new clients this year. This is our total marketing budget this year. Divide that by XYZ. Right. If that average number is less than $50, then we're doing, we're doing it correctly. Correct. The, the metrics match. 
If it's way higher than that, okay, well then we need to reevaluate things. Yeah. So is there something that's we're bleeding money on that we need to pull back on, or sure. is there something that's more effective that we could be investing more yeah. into? And heaven forbid, it's you, <laughs> we and we run into this where their cost of acquisition was more than the lifetime cost of the customer. Yeah. They they were pouring tons of money into get getting customers, and they just weren't seeing it back. Now, so. Uh, but the big reason that that metric is so important is because whenever we sit down with a client uh, and we go over that number with them, some of them are a little shocked. They're mm -hmm. like, what do you mean? Why would it, uh, you know, like, like, well, especially for higher ticket, yeah. like higher ticket service, you know, for like our video production company, you know, we, we work on projects that are multiple thousand dollars. We typically have a longer customer journey, which we'll talk about in a second. Right. Um, and so, you know, it can cost more and take longer to get a customer, but the, they have a typically a higher lifetime value for yes. sure. So, if we were to say the, you know, do the whole math and everything like that, and we realize that a good target cost of acquisition for a customer for Creative Edge might be five hundred thousand dollars, and you're like, well, that sounds like a lot. Well, actually, no, it's it it fits within every other metric right. that we just talked about. And if we're walking away with a, a good, uh, good, you know, new customer base, we're getting good qualified customers because of the quality of the marketing material, then you're like, okay, well, cause it's easy to go like, well, my, my sales funnel, you know, it cost me $20 per lead. Well, depending on your company, that could be great or that could be horrible. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you really need to know that thing. And again, for higher ticket companies, you got to get comfortable with the idea that you are going to be, it's going to cost you more money to get a qualified lead yes. that converts into a customer. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that last little piece of the puzzle really converted the customer avatar into a completely holistic tool yes. that our customers understand that we have as that point of reference to always come back to. And for us to then just say, hey, this is we're, we're, we're hitting our metrics right. Your, your MER and your cost of customer acquisition is, is working. It's, yeah. it, we got it. Yeah. And, and it also helps kind of soften the blow where it's like, oh, man, it's going to cost us. I don't want to spend $100 or $150 to get a new client. It's like, okay, let's, let's take the client out of this. If, if we know that the numbers work and the numbers track and that's we've seen statistically it costs $150, to get a lifetime, uh, it would be about say five hundred dollars. If if I told you you could walk into a bank, give them one hundred fifty, and they would give you five hundred, would you go spend one hundred fifty all day every? I would find every hundred dollar fifty hundred fifty dollar bill I could find and take that to the bank. So it's that same concept, and that's kind of helping to work with either your your own marketing department, uh, your own probably your own financial department. We have to spend how much? No, 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 we don't have a marketing budget for that. Well. You, this is this is hard ROI, and that's why tracking these numbers is so important, um, because it's it is a direct translation where, if the numbers are correct and if you're doing it correctly, and we especially if you have those figures going forward, um, based on hard numbers that you've collected, it's a lot easier to justify to those accounting figures where it's no, yes, it's a lot to pay, but yes, we're going to get even more out of it. Mm -hmm. So, we've got our customer. Avatar. Amanda, Amanda is ready person. to go. And then yep. like we've said before, sometimes it's multiple ones, you know, so like depending on your business, uh, you might have more than one. So for like the, the uh, spa that we were talking about, mm. they have kind of their, they have a core one that's kind of in the, um, in their forties or like 45, yeah, 45 is yep. what we put down. Um, but then there's also another demographic of, of women that are in their, like mid twenties, um, sure. that are, you know, they don't maybe have a lot of other, like, this is their version of, of a bar. They, yeah. you know, some, some guys work for the weekend and they go, they save up and they go party yeah. for, for them. It's, I want to work to have this really great spa experience. Yeah. And that's a different demographic. They don't got kids. They, you know, they, they're just, they have fur babies and right. Yeah. So that's a whole different person. And, right. And that requires, so you don't want to have like 50, uh, avatars mm -hmm. because that just complicates things but yeah. you might have two three four depending on your business or depending on your the different products and services you sell like so at the arcade we have two main uh brands we have mm -hmm. edge vr arcade which is family entertainment and edge gamers lounge which is competitive esports and the you're family me, you're telling me those aren't the same you can't just know. put out one ad for all of it <laughs> <laughs> not exactly yeah um so for family entertainment we know that the the key decision makers on there are typically moms. Yeah. 
dads too, but moms are usually the ones going, we, let's take the kids to do something. Um, and then for, for competitive esports, you know, it's typically male, um, younger in their 20s and early 30s. Yeah. Very different. Very, very different. And so thing. that's why we split up. You know, at one point we had them as under kind of a similar, the single brand umbrella. Yeah. Like now we split it off so that each one of those Edge Gamers Lounge can be meme centric, Edge VR Arcade can be family friendly. Yeah. Uh, and it, it worked incredibly yeah. well and it was incredibly necessary. And that, that also changed, you know, kind of, well, you know, we can get into the customer journey here, but that, that changed where we started talking to our, our potential, you know, our target audience. We can talk to the our our the moms of the kids that are coming to play, and we can go on to mommy blogs, and we can go into um, some of the local chamber where we know that that families are coming to gain information. Yep. And then for the gamers, we can go right on Discord. We might not meet our target audience for Edge VR on Discord, but that's where EGL that is where they're living. Yep. And so we're able to target TikTok and Discord and and start building communities and start building content specific for that. And that is totally wildly different, not even just in messaging, but the whole format of how we do a marketing campaign is going to be different for those two audiences. One thing you always say is be present where you're present. That's exactly and, right. And so it's important to have a, uh, not just have those channels, right. but also to be present on those channels. Yeah. We have we have staff that go on Discord and interact with the, those customers. Then we have people that are, you know, we have our, our, our Facebook for the VR arcade. That's, you know, Facebook and Instagram are much bigger uh, platform for that our demographic yeah. for family entertainment. So, but at the same time, the, the edge, uh, gamers lounge, Facebook, we still have content there, but it is not as, uh, a, uh, active as a, of an audience Correct. and, and, and uh, platform. So we've got our avatar or multiple avatars. Mm -hmm. Well, what do we do with it? What, what does that translate into? And, and as I said before, what we first started off with the avatar, it was a great tool, but we, when we added on the customer journey, it really created a completely holistic uh, presentation, ideation, and, and marketing. It's like once you have these tools, the marketing just sets itself up. Yeah. You know, okay, I need to have a thing here and a thing here and a thing here. You know, it's it's like building a blueprint and going, well, we put a wall there, so we got to put drywall on it. Like there, there's no... There's no question marks with that. Yeah. Um, and the, the idea behind the customer journey is uh, the very simplified version of it is that, you know, uh, customers go through a journey going from not being aware of your product to then kind of, you know, knowing that your category of product exists, then becoming familiar with your brand, and then finally getting to the point of making a decision and then some people stop there, though. Right. That's a lot of places stop there. Even even if you go and you look for um, customer journey infographics or if you look for information online, a lot of what you'll see are those three. Yeah, um, they stop right at the point of conversion. And then, yeah, we got the you money. Got, you got it. You got the money. But we're going to explain in a second why it's super important to have all levels of that. Yeah. Before we do that, though, I did want to drop uh, talk about our Video Pathfinder webinar. Heck yes. Uh, that has been an, an amazing tool. We've had so many people sign up for it, yeah. and we've gotten so much great feedback yeah. on it. So in as much as this customer avatar and customer journey is such an essential tool to mapping out an effective marketing campaign, uh, the type of content and the categories of content, how you interact with them in those platforms, is also a necessary uh, thing to focus on. And we map that completely out on the Video Pathfinder webinar. We talk about the four categories of social media. We talk about how to create effective ads uh, ads, mm -hmm. and and how to not just have crappy ads that <laughs> just show up in your feed and you ignore, but actually yeah. are engaging and cover all the needs of the customer journey that we talked about. Right. So check it out, videopathfinder.com. Completely free to sign up and uh, let us know what you think. Yeah. So going back to the customer journey, the first step, of course, is, uh, is well, first of all, somebody to be unaware that you exist. Yeah. So um, unaware of you or your product or service. And that can be as simple as, you know, like they didn't know they had a problem. Right. Uh, right. That, you know, so in that type of marketing, you, have, you can't lead with, uh, oh, you know, this is why our product is the best of this product. Yeah. I don't even know that they have a problem in the first place. Well, and and it may be a great ad, it may be a great, but it's like, oh, I don't, I don't that need that. Apply to me, yeah, right. yeah. So in that message, we often want to be going after education mm -hmm. or or establishing a problem or helping them realize, because as we talked about before, the only time that a sale goes through is when the money in your pocket is worth less than a problem. Right. This product sol solves. If I don't feel that I have that problem, yeah, 
I'm not going to spend any money. Right. Simple exactly. as that. So then you move up to the next stage, which is aware of the thing, aware yeah. of the problem, aware that there's different brands out there. You know, so like I'm I'm traveling to a city and there's, you know, I need I need to get a hotel. Yeah. Uh, so there's a couple hotel options out there. So, you know, so like that's now I have a, I, I now have a need and I'm aware, but I, I haven't singled out anyone specifically. Right. Um, then we start moving on to being aware of your brand. Yeah. And the that transitional point where it's like, hey, there's options. I'm interested. But then the brand is now one that I'm really considering. Yeah. Again, another marketing message needs to be approached there. Right. Because if you spend a lot of your time trying to, again, talk to that earlier demographic, the people that are barely aware of the problem, yeah, and you try to use that same marketing message on these people, usually at this point is where we start to do retargeting ads. That's sure. where they're much more effective. Because that person's already like in, getting close to that decision-making point. Yeah. And if you're telling them, here's all of the stuff that you already know, that's another reason for them to skip your ad right. or to jump past it because they're like, I already know this. This yeah. is, this isn't, this I is don't an care. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, like oftentimes people will say when they're trying to make a decision, they'll say, I, I just need more time. And mm. that's rarely the, the case. Usually what it is is they need more information. Right. Um, so they either need to, they, that time that they want is to process more information mm -hmm. or receive more information so again, are you giving them enough information? Yeah. Are they able to find it? A lot of times they're going to look for reviews. They're going to look for your product on YouTube. I, I what amazes me so often is when I'll do a YouTube search for a product and all I find are other people's videos <laughs> yeah. for that product. And, yeah. and I can't even find like a product overview from the company themselves. Right. Right. This amazes me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then we then move up to that conversion point right. where they make that purchasing decision and they're ready to buy. Yeah. Uh, and great. Awesome. Are we done, Ben? Uh, according to some, <laughs> no, I mean, really we're, we're halfway there. So, uh, where a lot of people lack. So we've got awareness. We've, we've gone through consideration. They've, they've weighed out all the options and Hey, great. They converted. They're yours. They, they are your customer. Now what? And, and I think this is a big miss. This is a missing piece that a lot of people, uh, just kind of lose sight of. And that's the loyalty. And where we say, all right, you have a customer. How do you keep that customer? How do you keep them coming back? Maybe, you know, for, uh, for Edge VR, um, how do we get people back in the doors? They had a great experience. They, they decided to come here. What are we doing here to make sure that it was a great experience? And then how are we following up to make sure they know that they're invited back? And it doesn't, I know a lot of people are like, well, we'll just give them 10% off. They already like you. Well, but are you doing enough to to draw them in and create a customer experience that you're creating a fan base um, to really have them want to engage with you again? All right. Yeah. Having good loyalty marketing is so important. And yeah, obviously there's like loyalty programs like get 10 bucks off on yeah. your birthday or whatever. And, and that's fine. You can definitely do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it can be other things like reminding your customers how great a time that they had. Yeah. Um, you know, encouraging them to take photos and then rewarding them for pay, for posting yeah. it on social media uh, with either a discount or something like that. Like one promotion we ran for a while was like on the bottom of our receipts, we would say, if you uh, if you come in and show us a picture that you posted on Facebook of your your, your last day here, you get ten percent off your next go. Amazing. Uh, yeah. And so you know, it's just because that's that's a free marketing tool for us. Right. You know, advocacy is is one of the most important. Uh, points that uh, that people can have like people trust what other people say about your brand right. way more than what you ever say about right. it um and so and and that's really the the last step in the whole equation you know if you look at a rainbow and you see all the colors you know you got mm. your red you know orange yellow green so blue pretty. and and we look at that those colors but there's like there's infrared and there's ultraviolet yeah. and and the ultraviolet to me of of this rainbow of it is not just loyalty but advocacy. That's the key. And yep. and that's where again people in their spectrum of marketing completely glaze over that because they're like great they're loyal. Yeah. But they could be doing a lot more for you than just that. And and this is a fun one to really talk through with either yourself or your clients where are you giving your loyal fans? Are you giving the people that really love you? Uh, we've, we've talked to so many people who are like, oh no, we have so many repeat customers and they love coming back. It's great. What are they saying about it? Who are they telling about it? 
are you giving your audience and giving your customers the, the vocabulary and the information that they need to be able to properly evangelize your brand? And, and once you start creating messaging where it's like, Hey, you love us, here's how you can tell others. Um, and this is, this is where it gets really fun for me. Cause we were talking about that cost of acquisition. Right. And so you say, all right, it takes me $50 to get a new client, you know, for, for their, for their lifetime value. What if instead of kind of randomly, you know, hoping that spending $50, we know numerically, statistically, if you spend 50, you'll get 150. That's great. But what if you actually have someone that's saying, I'm going to bring someone in with me? Well, now you can, you know, you can afford to give them $50. And that is going to be one of the most sure ways of advertising that you are going to, if you want a surefire way, let it be word of mouth and have them like a direct referral is an incredible way to get a uh, high uh, effectiveness of your return on investment. Because you say, all right, I have $50 to give you if you bring in a friend. That's a great, that's a great incentive. Now you've just made an even more loyal fan and they're going to start telling everybody um, if, if they really enjoyed your, what you have to offer. Right. Um, or if, if you say like you get 20 bucks, they get 20 bucks. Right. Like, you know, yeah. and then you're even lower than that number. So, I mean, like when you start looking at it that way, you can be a lot more open with your pocketbook because you know what this is doing. This is actually more cost effective yep. than just, you know, running ads and, and seeing what the hell yeah. they perform. Yeah. But you, you have to be able to give your audience a voice and give them, give them the vocabulary that they need to share the message that you want shared. There's a lot, if you look at reviews there, uh, whether it's on Yelp, on Google, wherever it may be, uh, there's a lot of things that are being said that may be different than the, the perception that you want to portray out there. So by, by really focusing in on your audience, in fact, I had a, there was a plumbing company. We had, um, we had a leak that we needed addressed and the, the, um, with the, when the guy was all done, he's like, Hey, listen, uh, even more valuable for me than a tip would be if you would go on and leave a five-star review with my name saying what you appreciate about the service flat out told me at the end of it. And I was like, Oh, that's one. That's no money out of my pocket. It's much easier for me to just go on and say, yeah, Matt was absolutely great. I uh, really appreciated how you took the time. It, it took me all of three minutes and they were, they, I picked them because they had the most reviews out of anyone in the city. And now I know why. And so if you're helping to frame that with all of your cl customers, clients, where you're saying, please say this about us, or please let us know what you think. Um, and then you, you can start to dictate what they're, what they're experiencing, what they're seeing, and you can respond accordingly. Absolutely. So that's my favorite. So if you got the customer avatar, you got the customer journey, you have the great building blocks to an effective marketing campaign. Yeah. And you can always come back to it every single time when we have these tools for our clients, they're, they're like the, the 10 commandments yeah. and, and we, we hold them up every single time. And they're like, are we creating content that is following is reaching this target, uh, this, this customer avatar and is, uh, do we have content that's throughout every phase of this, of yeah. this customer journey? Yeah. Cause if we have gaps, that's where we should start focusing on filling it up. Right. And, and the other side of that is if, if we start ideating content, do we just hold it up as a mirror. Do we say, all right, does it, does it talk to these frustrations? Does it talk to these goals? If yes, great. We know we're on the right track. If no, well, let's tweak it so that we can be more effective. A lot of times, a lot, a lot of times people say, we have this idea. We're going to go out and shoot it. And we're going to see if this hits our target audience. That's just money wasted. But if you can, if you can really say, all right, we have this message. This is how we want to showcase it to this audience at this point of their customer journey. Your your ROI on that is going to be so much more effective because you're you're intentional with it, and that's really what it comes down to is being intentional with uh, who you're marketing to, where you're marketing to them, and what you're trying to tell them. Time for the pop culture corner. Pop culture corner. All right, we had to skip last week because of or last time because of yeah. a busy schedule, but Timing constraints. We got some fun stuff to talk about. I know what I want to talk about. What do you want to talk about? I want to talk about Mario. Yes. And Dungeons and Dragons. Ah, uh, let's talk about Dungeons and Dragons first. Okay. Have you seen it? D no, not yet. You I haven't seen Mario yet either. No, I uh, I was I went to put it in the the Blu-ray player last night, and then I remember that my daughter was right upstairs above our theater, and I want to crank that. I want to hear Bowser's song so loud. So, <laughs> um, so she's 
she's going to be with grandma and grandpa tonight. So I'm going to be planning on just. Why are you cr- waiting on showing it to her? You just want to. I want to vet, vet it, it first. Okay. Yeah, she's five. And I've, I've seen a lot of reviews saying it's great for five-year-olds. I've seen a lot saying I would do eight plus so or six plus. So I just, I like to vet movies before okay. sure. But I, there's I'm been, trying to think of it from that perspective. The, um, my, my youngest judo is, is six. And so like, I mean, he, he he's, has a little bit of a higher tolerance in certain areas than, sure. than other things. But um, yeah, that one, I mean, it, it's a, it's a big animated cartoon with a, with a dragon that breathes fire, a right. cartoon dragon. Right. But, yeah. yeah. So you know your child better than she, anyone. So part of it is she, like years ago, she had a nightmare about a Christmas dragon that stole socks. And now it is, like she still talks, like she, it was a vivid, vivid memory where she woke up just in hysterics and turns out one of our neighbors has like this giant Christmas dragon that they put as, a, as like a little present and it has a hat, like this little Santa hat. It's adorable. But in the mind of it, she would have been like three at the time. Uh, in the mind of a three-year-old, that was horrifying. So yeah, I just I I want to see it before, and I'm sure it'll be fine. But I just want to make sure that. Did we talk about Mario the last time? I don't think so. Well, it wasn't the last time. Either way, I'll talk about it again. Forgive okay. me if we talked about it previously. But uh, I so I am a diehard Mario fan. Like I, I on my top five IPs, Nintendo and Mario is is up there. Can you tell the story of why Mario is so so important? When well, did, when did it come out? Well, it came out the year I was born, oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the there are some some games that kind of solidified what video gaming mm, was for me. Yeah. Um, and Mario was one of those. You know, it was one of the early games that you could play multiplayer. Sure. Even though it was kind of <laughs> mishmash and multiplayer. Yeah. Um, and you know, I just I liked the the vibe of it. Yeah. You know, especially when. Like I like Nintendo, but when Super Nintendo came out, I was like, "Man, this is great!" Like sure. Super Mario World, still to date my favorite game of all time. Yeah, and uh, you know, the uh, probably another game in in all of gaming would be Halo, would be one that also sure. and and that solidified my love for multiplayer gaming. Mm-hmm. It's one of the reasons that we started an arcade is just because <laughs> like I we wanted a place for people to come and have fun together. Yeah, right. Yeah, and so and I mean, you've been to my house and mm-hmm. seen the craziness that I mm-hmm. have with, with gaming. So, uh, and then I kind of, uh, I don't want to say grew out of Mario, but like, it was just, there was a period where I was into other things and sure. then, then I had kids again and I fell back in love with all of Nintendo yeah. stuff. So it's been fun to enjoy it with them. So again, as a family thing, there are certain things that we enjoy together. They're Marvel stuff, Star Trek and Mario is a big one. Yeah. Um, and, when uh, you know Ubisoft uh, came out with a game a, f- a few years ago, Mario Plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle, mm-hmm. um, and it was it was really interesting to see their uh, the, the the game developers um, uh, reverence for sure. for Mario, like sure. how well they like it was. I, I remember hearing the story about when when the developer presented in front of Nintendo Shigeru Miyamoto, and they were all you guys like super nervous. He's like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, this is Shigeru Miyamoto. <laughs> Uh, and Nintendo was reviewing their proposal because this wasn't a commission game. It was their idea that they Ooh, came to yeah. Nintendo with. That's bold. Right. And Miyamoto goes, uh, where did you get the models for these? And they said, we built them from scratch. Mm. And they're like, these look like original assets yeah. from our games. Yeah. And that's how, how careful they were. So in that game, they were very, like, Mario has spoken uh in a couple games sure uh aside from his like Wahoo, me. let's yeah. go yeah. you know like that stuff um by the way he, your mario is way better than mine <laughs> i've practiced with my son a lot <laughs> yeah. uh but he uh he there were like super mario sunshine they had full voice acting yeah and uh it was kind of weird uh <laughs> but then like but then you could see like uh i bring up mario plus rabbit's kingdom metal it's like it was a whole story where there wasn't Mario didn't talk, mm-hmm. um, and there's movies that have done it, like uh, you know, half of Wally. Yeah, there's really no dialogue, right. and then uh, movies like Shaun the Sheep, where sure. they've they've managed to do an entire movie without anybody saying a word. Yeah. Um, so I was part of me was curious, like, could they would they go that direction with Mario? Mm-hmm. 
And then when I saw that Illumination was doing it, I was like, no, they're not going to do that. Yeah. They're, they're going to do the Illumination treatment. And Which we know you're not a fan of. I'm not a huge fan yeah. of Illumination style. Like, I don't say that their movies are horrible or anything like that. It's just a style thing. Like, sure. Like, you know, we don't know how, like, um, Disney or uh, Pixar approaches their their style, their tone, the, the seriousness of the content that they do. Like, I always, I always feel like always Pixar content is they're just using animation as their paintbrush, but mm. they their storytelling is very modern and very contemporary, very um, very serious. It isn't like, oh, it's a goofy cartoon. Sure. It's, you know. Versus imagine or Illumination was very much goofy cartoon in yeah. a lot of their stuff, yeah. which, which is fine. Uh, but that's not what I wanted sure. out of a Mario movie yeah. personally. So I went in with a bit of trepidation mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, watched it. You know, they, Chris Pratt's Mario is not the, um, uh, the Mario voice that we are familiar with. They, they start off with it kind of that. And sure. then they kind of, they, they imply that it's his a character that he plays. Yeah. And then, then they move on to his more Boston accent. Sure. Which I didn't find as distracting as I thought it would be. Boston, uh, New York? Yeah, New whatever. York, yeah. That area, era, <laughs> the, sure. the, the, uh, New England area. Sure. Um, so, anyways, that that uh, wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. The 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 uh, goofy cartooniness that Illumination has it was definitely present. Sure, but again, not distracting. Story wise, it was fine. Yeah, you know, like it, Mario Mario games have never been known for great story per sure. se. You know, it's the, it was always a the story was just there to justify the mechanisms. Yeah. Like you're going to rescue rescue Princess Peach. Right again. <laughs> so here's the reason, and now play the game. Yeah. Enjoy the game. That's all you care about. So that was what, just the thing. You know, yeah. I, I, that's why I'm like, okay, you know, I, but what do you want out of a Mario movie? Yeah. Do you want it to be this amazing drama? Or, you know, because I look at like the, um, the Buzz Lightyear movie, mm. and they tried to be fancy with it. Right. They tried to be original, and it wasn't a bad sci fi movie. It was just a bad Buzz Lightyear movie. Sure. And sure. so you could also say like they could have gone that way with Mario and then tried to be all super amazing storytelling. Yeah. And then I'm like, but this isn't Mario anymore. Yeah, so right. I walked away going, this is entertaining. It's fun. I will watch it many times with my family. Mm -hmm. uh, I already bought it. So there's that. Sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was, I was satisfied yeah. with that. I don't know if there was a... If the direction I would have gone would have been a bit more Nintendo stylistically. Sure. And it might have worked, but, you know, I'm not a movie maker. Yeah. yeah so. the, what I am most excited about is how they were able to do Bowser. I think that could have been a throwaway character. Maybe not a throwaway character, but it, it would it very easily could have been a secondary character. And I think they have done a great job of uh, making him a primary just a primary motivator other than just he's a baddie. Like, sure. They, from what they I gave him some comic relief, um, and he doesn't necessarily have that too often in the Mario yeah, games. Right. Like, sometimes, more in, like, the Mario Party games where sure. it's like, oh, my gosh, something bad happened to Bowser. So, you know, like, yeah. but, yeah, they... They made they yeah they rode that line pretty well. I know that the reviews have been mixed on on it as a whole, but the, of course the movie is like one of the top yeah animated movies of all time. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean it's hard to say like the there are time there's a place for a popcorn flick. I'm totally fine sure. just zoning out. A movie doesn't have to be a perfect artistic masterpiece every <laughs> yeah. single time. Yeah, uh, and that's probably the best placement for it. Like that's sure. you know what we want is. Way obviously, the last time Nintendo tried to be artsy fartsy, and they did the the well, I guess it wasn't Nintendo, they, but the the studio that tried to do the Super Mario movie back in the eighties. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm yeah. glad that they didn't redo that. But yeah, it's it's good, it's enjoyable, and it's great to watch with your kids. Yeah. Uh, for those who have seen it, you may not know. So I, I this came across my TikTok where this uh, Bowser song actually wasn't originally in the video. Mm -hmm. And it was like a year into production where they said, hey, we, we think we want Bowser to sing. And Jack Black was like, I will. Well, first he said no. And then after some deliberation with him and his manager, they, he came back and was like, well, we'll do it if I get to write the song and have complete creative control over it. 
And without hesitation, they're like, yeah, go for it. And and I think that speaks to one the creator and, and Nintendo notoriously does not like to give up creative control over anything. So the fact that the movie happened was astounding. The fact that they let Jack Black go off and say, We trust you with your character with this character because we know what it means to you, I think is a testament to exactly how how great this movie is. And that's that's one thing I'm excited to see. And so what we ended up with was I think it was supposed to be some little like cheesy just a little blip and he turned it into this full feature that they're like, yes, this, this is completely yeah. epic and rock ballad, rock ballad. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny, like how it's actually been like on radio and stuff like that. Right. It's not that long. It's no. like a minute and a half yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, all right. So now Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons. All right. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I love board game. I love tabletop gaming, but I've never been huge into D and D as a, as a player or anything like that. Like I, I enjoy the genre. I've been, mm. I've played, other games that have been D and D themed, sure. Um, but I've never been a D and D player. Uh, yeah. I know plenty of people that do. My main thing about it is, as we've talked about before, I own mm-hmm. over two hundred fifty board games, and uh, the D and D is a very consuming game. Yes, and so the to idea do it well, doing, right? Yeah, and to really do it to its full potential, right? Uh, so it's just not. I would rather play other games, and you know, across my time, as opposed to be committed to one over a year or two or something yeah, like that. Yeah. So that's my main thing. It's I have no issues with D&D. I'd, I've always been fascinated by it. In fact, I watched a uh, a YouTube video of some guys that uh, use ChatGPT as a dungeon mm, master, yeah. and I'm like, that would be kind of fun. I'm, I'm almost half tempted to do this yeah. on, our, on our gaming channel, Split Screen Gamer. I haven't done a video on there in a super long time, but I'd be like, that would be kind of fun to do um, to do that here where we would like, do yeah. our own chat gpt driven uh uh dungeons and yep. dragons session but well what was neat about that one is you know if you have a dungeon master they kind of they usually have like a script they have a story that they'll they'll often try to lead as much as they can you right. know as the dice rolls yeah and you if you go in a direction they it. don't want you to go that they just can't let you go and they'll be like uh nothing happened over there they yeah. open the door there's the door's locked you know like like but in chat gpt they would be like you know all right and now you're going in this direction uh Kill everybody and steal the ship and go over there. Okay, now over here. It's, <laughs> right. It's, yeah. You know, they it's, just they let them go hog yeah. wild for it. That's neat. Yeah. Anyway, not that has nothing to do with the movie, but <laughs> but to that said, like I, I did talk to some people that uh, were Dungeons and Dragons fans, and so they were like, Yeah, there's this part and that like a lot of it mm-hmm. I recognize, but there's still lots that I still didn't. Like, um, you know, I know there's um locations in there that are mm. you know it's it's set in it's its own universe so yep, it's, they've right. got you know all sorts of lore for it um it's it was one of those things where like i i i liked um parts of the new willow show okay um it had that kind of 80s mm. uh I, I, you know fantasy action movie sure. feel to it uh, with modern graphics, the ending of, of season one of Willow I did like, but there was a lot of hit or miss throughout the whole sure. thing, um, and you could tell that there was times where they were shoving in humor hmm. where it didn't quite need to be, and, yeah. and characters that were being angsty and all that kind of stuff. D and D Honor Among Thieves was just great. It has a pretty big cast, doesn't it? It it did, yeah. There was a lot of uh, AAA. Or, or a, a what are we going to A-list for? celebrities. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Thank you. Um, triple A-list. Triple Those a. are like... Those triple are a. I got triple A yeah. games and, and <laughs> A-list. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, like uh, Chris Pine, I enjoy mm, from yeah. you know, like Star Trek and, and a lot of the stuff that he's done. But uh, his, yeah, his character was a lot of fun. Mm. Um, I feel like I need to watch it this, a second time to fully enjoy it. Because a lot of times I go into a movie with too many expectations that I'm like just like... Where mm, sure. where is this? Yeah, and on the second watch through, I was that way with like the first Star Trek reboot, the J.J. Yeah. Abrams one, where I was like, okay, well, I'm I, I understood the general idea of what was happening, sure. but I needed to let it settle as what the decision they make, and then I watched it again, knowing that, yeah, and I appreciated it more the second time, yeah. Uh, so I'll probably feel that way with D and D, but uh, yeah, lots of comedy, lots nice. of lightheartedness. Um, you know, you you have the big bosses things that always happen in these types of movies, and it is does it fall apart at that point? Does it just become a punch fest that sure. sometimes happens in like superhero movies or other fantasy yeah. movies? 
Like I enjoyed Warcraft a bit, the the uh, the Warcraft movie that came out several years ago. Yeah. Um, the ending got to be a little bit of a just a big convoluted mess. Sure. Um, but I felt that the the ending it was like right at the point where it was about to overstay its welcome. Mm. It ended and in a very fun and satisfying way. Nice. And I'm like, great. It's like the pacing was well oh. well crafted throughout the whole film. Kudos, Dungeons and Dragons. That's high yeah. praise. Yeah. Yeah. So. A lot of fun. I know that the movie was was very highly rated, and so hopefully we'll see more. Um, where where is it out on? Uh, it's on Paramount Plus actually. Oh, okay. All so right. that's where I watched it. Gotcha. Because of Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, speaking of season two of Strange New Worlds is coming out in two days. Actually, it'll be, it'll be in one day when uh, this podcast is released. Yeah. So stoked about that for sure. Yeah. Um, I need to get you watching some of that. Season one is available on YouTube right now. I don't okay. know if it's indefinitely or sure. just for a period of time. A Strange New Worlds or Picard? A Strange New Worlds, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, that, I find, is a great jumping on point for anyone. I mean, I, I will, if, if you were to say, where should I start if I was ever to watch Star Trek? There's a yeah. couple jumping on points that I would recommend. Um, if, you, if you are a person that doesn't mind the age of something... Mm. Original series, obviously, just go right through, yep. watch it in the order that it came out. You can do that, and that's a great way to experience it. Sure. If that's too old for you, um, then I would say the Genesis trilogy. Mm. So that's Star Trek two, three, and four. Sure. Uh, that's with still the original cast crew. It's it's a good story arc. Uh, if you like those those three, hop on and, and watch Star Trek six as well. The Discovery yep. Country. That's a good ending of those characters. So you could watch sure. those four movies and that's a very satisfying conclusion. Yeah. Another jumping on point would be Star Trek The Next Generation, of course. Um, because it's episodic, I if, if you were picky, I, w- I could give you specific episodes and say, watch this handful of episodes and then that'll tell you if you liked yeah. you know, that, that era. Yeah. Deep Space Nine is a great, uh, great serialized story, but I usually say... Watch Next Gen. Once you like Next Gen, sure. then Deep Space Nine really sucks you in even more. So I wouldn't say that. For some people, Voyager is a great jumping that's, on point. That's, that's mine. And so I'm not opposed to that. Um, but if we're starting to move, like, I find Voyager to be more satisfying if you've gone through Next Gen, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. Mm, okay. And, like, that that's that becomes a nice bow on top. Sure. Um, because but so if you're to lead with with voyager then go back it might feel a little dated in certain points or whatever like that again it's not a huge deal yeah but uh so the 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 last two would be uh the star trek 2009 movie if you just want a fun action packed one you can watch those the those that trilogy of films modern you know uh, it's it's not the same tone of of more classic trek but it's still a great way to introduce you to the thing and then finally strange new worlds yeah um, and because it's also episodic, uh, I know some people say discovery, that's fine too, but like, I don't know, strange new worlds, you can, you get a feel for the episodic nature that, uh, that Star Trek was, you know, the, the, the show, the original series, next gen, even DS9 for all of its serialized storytelling and Voyager, they were all, uh, uh episodic with the occasional story threads and they were very kind of anthology type shows. Sure. So. You could find that's why it's like it's hard to ever say like you know what's a good thing to start with. I would I would say start with like five episodes and I would give you them that's because fair. like maybe you like the comedy side of it, maybe you like the action, the yeah. explosions, the yeah. drama, the you know there's so many different tones that it has. Um, so, anyways, yes, nice. Strange New Worlds is a is a great place to also hop on, and it's out on YouTube. It is score score. Right. Well, this was a nice long episode. Yeah, uh, but hopefully everybody got some good value out of it. I think we. Talk about some good stuff. We got it, yeah. And we will talk more about uh, other things that we walk our customers through with, you know, beyond the target uh, the target audience discovery process. Because right. once we have that, then we got to make then the content. We'll, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. tune in next right. time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for watching.